Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them, who passing through the valley of Baker make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Every child of God longs to get to the point in his Christian walk where perfect rest, perfect peace, and perfect trust in God will immediately overtake and consume every fear, ease every burden of life, and take the sting out of every pain. But we may not always be successful in resting quietly and confidently in God's care. Troubles may come upon us so quickly that we feel overpowered by the distress, or we may find our trials of a more chronic nature, and they seem to wear away daily at the fiber of our faith. God is not unaware of these trials which perplex us. He is permitting each experience to exercise our faith that we might press on from strength to strength as new creatures. Sorrow and griefs may, and perhaps often will, come in like a flood, but the Lord will be our stay and strength in every experience which he permits. The soul that has never known the discipline of sorrow and trouble has never yet learned the joy and preciousness of the Lord's love and helpfulness. It is in seasons of overwhelming sorrow and grief when we draw near to the Lord that he draws specially near to us. So the psalmist found it when in his deep affliction he cried to God saying, Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. The perfect righteousness of our Savior is our glorious dress arrayed in which we may come to God with humble boldness, courage, even into the presence of the great Jehovah, the King of kings and Lord of lords. If on a quiet sea toward home I calmly sail, with grateful heart, O God, to thee I'll own the favoring gale. But when the surges rise and rest delay to come, Blessed be the tempest, kind the storm, which drives me nearer home. Soon shall the waves and storms all yield to thy control. Thy love will banish all alarms and darkness from my soul. Teach me in every state to make thy will my own. And while the joys of sense depart, to live by faith alone. Like the fabled Halcyon, which built its nest and brought forth its birdlings in the midst of the sea, the true child of God can be at rest even amidst the billows and storms of life, and can prosper as a new creature and accomplish all the good pleasure of God's will. This unwavering trust in the Lord, this abiding rest of the soul, this zeal in God's service is a matter of growth. They go from strength to strength, the psalmist declares. They can smile even through their tears, knowing that according to his promise, all things are working together for their good. Yes, we go from strength to strength. Over and over we find ourselves crying out to the Lord for his promised grace to help in every time of need. God is not disappointed when we come to him often in tears. He knows our frame and, like a loving father, is pleased to see that we are still seeking to hold his hand.
directed by thy word. This is one of the most important keys to developing this strength of character, which continues to willingly submit to the loving hand of the potter. And as the Apostle Peter expressed it, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The knowledge of the truth is the sanctifying power, the peace and joy imparting power and is the precious evidence of divine grace or favor. Disappointments are never realized by those whose peace has its fountain in the perennial springs of God's eternal truth. These perennial springs of God's eternal truth are the vision which keep the child of God pressing on when their crosses seem heavy. Well did the prophet say, where there is no vision, the people perish. We must keep the vision, the hope of the full establishment of the kingdom, alive. It is this vision which inspired our master, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, and so may we endure to the end if we keep that vision alive. our heavenly bridegroom as our example. He is sympathetic to our every cry, as he experienced the heights of joy and the depths of sorrow. So must we. The life of every human being has its lights and shadows, its heights of joy and its depths of sorrow. These make up a large part of the warp and the wolf of experience. And the web of character which flows from the active loom of life will be fine and beautiful, or coarse and homely, according to the skill and carefulness with which the individual weaves into it the threads of experience. In every life, in the present reign of sin and evil, the somber shades predominate. And to such an extent is this true, that the Word of God aptly describes the human family in their present condition as a groaning creation. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth together until now, says the Apostle. The children of God are no exception to this universal rule. 
We also groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, the deliverance of our body, our company, the body of Christ. How comforting it should be that our Heavenly Father understands when we, at times, groan under the sorrows and pain of this life while in the flesh. And thank God that we have learned that there is a difference between groaning with creation and murmuring against the Lord. The one will yield the peaceable fruits of righteousness if we are rightly exercised thereby, whereas the other will only make us bitter and unpleasant to ourselves and others. In the midst of the cares, perplexities, and difficulties that come to the children of the Lord, we are to trust Him fully and to possess our souls in peace and patience. In every experience of sorrow and distress, and when the strain of the jarring discords and the stinging vexations and wounds that make the heart bleed threaten to overwhelm the spirit, let the child of God remember that He knows and loves and cares, and that His ministering angel is ever near us, and that no trial will be permitted to be too severe. The dear Master is standing by the crucible, and the furnace heat will never be permitted to grow so intense that the precious gold of our character shall be destroyed or even injured. Ah, no! If by His grace the experiences may not work for our good, they shall be turned aside. He loves us too well to permit any needless sorrow, any needless suffering. In that which God permits, He is developing in us sympathetic hearts by allowing us to be touched with the feeling of the world's infirmities. A farmer had some puppies he needed to sell. He painted a sign advertising the pups and set about nailing it to a post on the edge of his yard. As he was driving the last nail into the post, he felt a tug on his overhauls. He looked down into the eyes of a little boy. Mister, he said, I want to buy one of your puppies. I've got 39 cents. Is that enough to take a look? Sure, said the farmer. And with that, he let out a whistle. Here, Dolly, he called. Out from the doghouse and down the ramp ran Dolly, followed by four little balls of fur. The little boy pressed his face against the chain link fence. His eyes danced with delight. As the dogs made their way to the fence, the little boy noticed something else stirring inside the doghouse. Slowly, another little fluff ball appeared. This one noticeably smaller. In a somewhat awkward manner, the little pup began hobbling toward the others, doing its best to catch up. I want that one, the little boy said, pointing to the runt. The farmer knelt down by at the boy's side and said, Son, you don't want that puppy. He will never be able to run and play with you like these other dogs would. With that, the little boy stepped back from the fence, reached down, and began rolling up one leg of his trousers. In doing so, he revealed a steel brace running down both sides of his leg, attaching itself to a specially made shoe. Looking back at the farmer, he said, You see, sir, I don't run too well myself, and he will need someone who understands. This is the real sympathy, a real bond of sharing in the suffering of another because we know firsthand the struggle it will take to press on regardless. Our pastor reminds us that it is expedient that the bride member should be touched with a feeling of the world's infirmities and have sufficient sympathy to voluntarily bear some of the sorrows and griefs of those about them. Yes, we volunteered to be in the schoolhouse of the Lord and in it, we are learning to trust that His curriculum is the most valuable education we could ever encounter with the greatest reward we could ever attain.
There are lessons of immense value to be learned in this hard school of experience. Lessons of faith, of fortitude, of heroism, of courage, of endurance, of meekness, of patience, of sympathy for the suffering, and of loving helpfulness to others. There are works of grace to be wrought out in us which only the hard experiences of life can accomplish. For instance, we would be inclined to lean too much to our own understanding if we were not at times brought face to face with problems that baffle our skill. It is when we are afraid to touch such things that involve so much that in our perplexity we come to him who has kindly said, cast thy burden upon the Lord and he will sustain thee and ask him to undertake for us. But is it always well with my soul? Some of our dear brethren struggle with the fear that they will never be pleasing to the Father. They compare themselves with others and see themselves falling far short of even these imperfect followers of the Master. In times like these, we need to remind ourselves that even the noble apostle Paul shared in this disappointment of himself. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is faith, the recognition that the strength is not ours, the perfection is not ours, 
the victory will only be ours through Christ. Isaiah encourages that though we may be painfully aware that our own righteousness is as filthy rags, if we are willing to press on regardless, God can fashion us into vessels of honor for his use. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father. We are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. A Chinese water bearer had two large vessels, each hung on the end of a large pole which he carried across his neck and shoulders. One of the vessels had a crack in it, while the other was perfect and always delivered a full portion of water. At the end of the long walk from the stream to the master's house, the cracked vessel always arrived half full. All through the spring and early summer this happened daily with the water bearer delivering only one and a half vessels of water to his master's house. Of course, the perfect vessel was proud of its accomplishments, being perfect for which it was made. But the poor imperfect vessel was ashamed of its own imperfection and miserable that it was able to accomplish only half of what it had been designed to do. After three long months of what it perceived to be a bitter failure, the cracked vessel spoke to the water bearer one day by the stream. I am ashamed of myself because this crack in my side causes the water to leak out all the way back to the master's house. The water bearer said to the vessel, Ah, but did you not notice that there are flowers only on your side of the path, yet not on the other vessel's side? That is because I have always known of your flaw, and I planted flower seeds on your side of the path. Every day while we walk back, you have watered them, and now I am able to pick these beautiful flowers to adorn the master's table. By humbly accepting your lot, you have brought forth a blessing to me as I walked on the path and to our master. We must daily carry our earthen pitcher to this heavenly fountain to be replenished, for we are leaky vessels. We are not to feel discouraged if we do not find in ourselves the rapid growth that we desire to see. Strong, sturdy trees that can withstand the fiercest storms are not developed in a day. Their growth is a slow, steady process. We should show our loyalty to the Lord by renewed effort every time we fail. Therefore, as we evaluate our shortcomings, let us ever keep in mind that we do not have faith in ourselves, but in God through the gift of His Son. If we can say this, then we should go before the Lord with a fresh request that He supply the needed grace that we might press on, day by day, year by year, strength by strength.
will be with him in trouble is the promise. The intimation here is that the Lord will not necessarily prevent our getting into trouble. We might see the trouble coming and pray to the Lord, but he might not deliver us from the trouble. And we should not ask that we might be spared the affliction if his wisdom sees it best for us to have it. The trouble might prove very beneficial to us. The Lord has already told us in his word that we are to rejoice even under tribulation. For tribulation rightly received will work out for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So while the Lord does not promise us that we shall escape from trouble, he does promise that with the trouble he will give his children consolation of heart, sustaining grace that will enable them to rejoice even in the midst of tribulation. This was exemplified in our Lord Jesus and in the apostles. Paul and Silas were able to sing praises to God in prison with their feet fast in the stocks and their backs bleeding from the whippings which they had received. They could rejoice in tribulation for Christ's sake. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Are there times when we feel all alone in our cross-bearing and we wonder, where are our brethren? Why are they not here to help me carry this cross? In times like these, we remember our Lord's experience when he nearly fainted under the weight of his cross on the way to Golgotha. The Roman soldiers pulled out from the crowd a strong countryman named Simon who was just passing through. He was not a disciple and was perhaps unfamiliar with the innocence of Christ and the extreme burden he was under. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Brethren often do come to our assistance, but when they don't, should we be disappointed with them that they don't rush in to help? No, sometimes God sees that our brethren are ill-equipped to help us bear a particular cross and he will pull out from among the unconsecrated one who has the strength and means to help us. Or, if we really understood, we might find that our brethren may be bearing unseen crosses of their own, which are crushing them under the weight. It is God who will supply all our need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus.
There is great peace in just knowing that all things, even the most seemingly unbearable things, work together for good to those who love God and who have voluntarily accepted his call. Joseph, though sold into slavery by his brothers, rejoiced in even this. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Could it be that the experiences that are so difficult for us to endure may be the very experiences God is permitting, that we might be an instrument of His to restore the heart of another? If we have suffered the loss of a child, could we not communicate with sincerity to someone in the kingdom who lost their child and soothe the bitterness that might prevent them from embracing the Lord and seeing the wisdom of the permission of evil? Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. Severe trials and testings of our love for God and for his truth and our faith in him and in his promises are only a wise provision on God's part in view of the very high honor and responsibility of the great office to which he has called us. If it was proper that our Lord and Redeemer should be tested in all points as to faith and obedience before his exaltation to the excellent glory and power of the divine nature, much more so is it fitting that we, who were once aliens and strangers, far from God and children of wrath, even as others, should be thoroughly tested. As Joseph was tried, tested, and found faithful in his experiences, and then was raised to high exaltation. So it was for our master, and so it will be for his footstep followers. Sometimes the Lord's hand is very heavy. It was, in the case of our Lord Jesus, heavy, pressed down. But when the Lord felt the Father's hand pressing down, he meekly bowed himself beneath the weight in humble acquiescence to the will of the one whose purpose he had come to carry out. But the hand did not crush him, although it seemed to do so. Instead of being a crushing, it was the hand of love, testing his obedience to the full. The various tests of the present time are tests of faith and loyalty to God and of entire submission to his will. Commit thy way unto the Lord, Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Sometimes the desired comfort we seek seems delayed, but it is really timed carefully by our loving Father. He allows just the right amount of time to exercise our faith, to crystallize our character. Therefore, we learn to patiently wait for the promise of His tender providence. We must not be disappointed and allow our faith to falter when the test of patient endurance is applied, while the outward peace and quietness which we crave tarry long. Our Father has not forgotten us when the answer to our prayers seems to be delayed. Outward peace and calm are not always the conditions best suited to our needs as new creatures. And we would not desire conditions in which the precious fruits of the Spirit would not grow and develop in us. He who numbers the very hairs of our heads is never indifferent to the sufferings and needs of his weakest and humblest child. Yes, when conditions surrounding us appear overwhelming, we can find quietness in the midst of trouble. We can visualize God's angel sent to comfort us through whatever stresses of life may come our way. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes, 
that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. The Lord of hosts is with us. His promises, as well as his providences, are walls of salvation and protection on every hand. By and by, we shall learn which of the angels specially served us during our pilgrim journey. With what pleasure we shall become acquainted with the Holy Ones, whose mission it is in the divine providence to attend us in our pilgrim way. They will recount to us various scenes and incidents in our experiences, which we have been able only imperfectly to understand. They will show us how, as the Lord's providential agents, they shielded us and assisted us from time to time, according to the divine promises, to help in every time of need. With the information thus supplied to us, we shall be fully informed respecting all the obscure places in life's experiences and be enabled to rejoice more than ever in the divine love and care which not only bought us and sought us, but shielded us and helped us on to God in the glorious things of his provision in Christ. Recently, a dear sister testified of a test to her faith. At one point in her experience, she expressed, she was so pressed down by her trials that she questioned whether God had abandoned her. Was she unfaithful? Was she unworthy of his love? She saw the providential overruling in others' lives, but where was it in hers to help her lift this horrible burden off her shoulders? Perhaps she was not really the Lord's after all, she thought. By God's providence, she said she received a phone call from a sister who said, I'm praying for you, but I'm not asking God to remove this experience, only that he help you bear it. I love you too much to ask the Lord to take away the very thing that might be preparing you to receive your crown of life. That was it, she said. She needed to hear those very words. God had not abandoned her at all. In his love, he was preparing her for a place in one of his many mansions. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings.
The trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. But why is it that fiery trials must come to us? They come to prove you and to strengthen your character and to cause the principles of truth and righteousness to take deep root in your heart. They come like fiery darts from our great enemy Satan, whose wrath against the children of light is permitted to manifest itself in various ways. But his darts cannot injure those who securely buckle on the divinely provided armor of truth and righteousness. Yes, at times our most severe trials come as a direct attack from the adversary. He is especially on the lookout for those who are most active in the Lord's service. And so we must remember to keep on this armor of truth and righteousness. The great adversary is not interested in disturbing those who are asleep in Zion, but he is ever on the alert to mislead and entangle those who are awake. And the more active we become in the service of the Lord and the truth, and consequently the more actively opposed to Satan and error, the more he will fight against us. From Satan's standpoint, we, as a Gideon's band, armed with the truth, are more injurious to his cause than all others combined. When that noble servant of God, John Wesley, was zealous in opposing Satan and preaching a full consecration to God, he provoked Satan's enmity, and the latter found mouthpieces amongst ambitious and jealous false brethren who spread abroad vile rumors from time to time, not only assailing his teachings, but even his moral character. His brother Charles and some others came to him and said, John, you must answer this charge or your reputation is gone. John replied in substance thus, No, I will keep right along with my work. When I consecrated myself to the Lord, I gave him my reputation as well as all else that I possess. The Lord is at the helm. Our Lord Jesus, by his faithfulness, made himself of no reputation and was crucified as a blasphemer and between outlaws, yet he opened not his mouth. No, I will make no defense. The results we know, John Wesley is still loved for his work's sake in every civilized part of the world, but his traducers are forgotten. Pillars of faith, such as John Wesley, were, as the pastor called them, speckled birds, targets of the adversary. God permitted attacks from without, but also tests of submission from within, such as is illustrated in the life of the great apostle Paul. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The Lord recognized a personal danger to his beloved and faithful Apostle Paul, a danger of pride and self-exaltation, which, if it should develop, would soon unfit him for further service and rob him of his future reward. So the thorn in the flesh was permitted to come. It came not from the hand of the Lord, though by his permission, but as the Apostle affirms, it was the messenger of Satan to buffet him. At first he thought only of the pain and annoyance it caused him and of its hindrance to him in the Lord's work. 
Three times he besought the Lord for its removal, but no, it had come to stay, and the Lord mercifully made him to realize that though it was very undesirable to the flesh, it was nevertheless profitable to him spiritually. It is when we are weak, when we realize our own helplessness and incompetency, that we may be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And so on we go from strength to strength, like the young farmer who having just delivered a newborn calf, decided to pick up that calf each day, getting stronger and stronger until in one year he could lift a full grown bull. So the Lord is strengthening us for his purpose and to his glory. While yet the offering was upon the altar, the noise of the approaching hosts of the Philistines was heard. How would God assist his people? How could they hope for deliverance against the Philistine hosts? The deliverance came in the shape of a great, violent, sudden storm. And the Israelites, perceiving the opportunity, rushed onward with the storm, pursuing the Philistines, driving them before them, and thus gaining a great victory. The place of the victory was the very spot where 20 years before, the Ark of the Lord had been captured by the Philistines. Samuel there set a stone as a pillar and monument and called it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. So with Christians in their victories under the Lord's assistance, when by the Lord's grace they gained victories, they should set up memorials or monuments in their minds in their hearts and not pass these blessings by or forget that the victories were gained by help from on high. Every Christian therefore should have his Ebenezer's, his monuments of victory as it were, of divine assistance over his foes, the world, the flesh, and the adversary. And he should rejoice in these. Finally, brethren, lest we forget the many ways in which the Lord has brought peace to our hearts through the storms of life, let us make a record of these providences, that these may bring us comfort in future times of sorrow and distress. Let us always remember that while our heart and our flesh fail us, His eye never sleeps, His ear never shuts, and is always open to our cries for His promised grace to help in every time of need.